father, right? Hey, that was awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, hey, so speaking of happy Father's Day and just uh, we're going to start worship, but I had Steve Stansfield had a word during, work, during prayer this morning and love to have him come up and share right now about uh, just worship and about uh, where God's taking us today. So go for it. Good morning. When we were praying this morning, the one word that kept coming up is alignment. Um, and I got this picture, and this picture was a parade. And first of all, have you ever been to a parade? Is it quiet? No, there's lots of noise and lots of activity and celebration. And, and it was like we were all one unit, and a parade all goes in one direction. So it was like part of that same word, that alignment. We were all going in one direction. And last week, Todd, during his sermon, uh, did a thing where we yelled out an attribute of God. So let's do that for just a second. If you just yell out something that's good about God. That was pretty good, but that was kind of a quiet parade. Let's see if we can do it one more time. Ready? Go. That's awesome. Yes, come on. Yeah. So this morning, as we just begin to worship, just uh, just see that picture of us just as a parade. And as the parade went through the streets, this was another part of it, and everybody was yelling out an attribute of God. It was like the, the onlookers, the people of the community were looking at the parade, and they were like, what's going on? And they, they started to get excited, and they started joining in. It was like they became part of the parade. And the parade just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger before you know, the, the streets were filled with people just celebrating God. So, so this morning, we're just believing for that, and I'm just going to pray, and we'll get started. Father, we thank you <laughs> that you are a great God. And Father, we just invite you to be the, the, the master of ceremonies today as we, we go and, and celebrate you, God. Oh, we just want to go where you go. We want to do what you do. Whatever it is that you desire to do in us today, we say, yes, have your way. And we just choose to celebrate you just because you are so good. Amen. the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory. The King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Brings our chaos back into order. Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations. With truth and justice Shines like the sun In all of its brilliance The King of glory The King above all kings Oh, this is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me Who 
were slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy, worthy, worthy Oh, this is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me.
move, you move the mountains. And I believe, I see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way. And I believe, I see you do it again. I've seen you move, you move the mountains. And I believe. I see you do it again, made a way where there was no way. And I believe I see you do it again. I see you do it again. I see you do it again. Promise. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed. so faithful so faithful so faithful God you are God
am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am, so here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. I'll never know how much it costs. To see my sin upon that cross, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that. Sing it again, I'll never know. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross so here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Here I am, so here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely. All together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together love. All together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Sweet Jesus, even as we worship you with the words of this song and ponder the fact that you did pay a price we couldn't even fathom, carrying the weight of sins and judgments that none of us could even come close to, what else can we do but rededicate our lives to you? What else could we do as a love response but to say you can have us all. You can have every fiber of our being, every day of our life, every decision we make, every move we make. It all belongs to you. What, what else could we give but all of us? So Jesus, come and receive the sacrifice, the living sacrifice of our whole being today as a love gift back to you for demonstrating love that none of us can even begin to fathom. 
Receive these humble gifts, Jesus, and do whatever you can with them. We offer you these crumbs and these ashes and these filthy rags and say, make something glorious out of us. Make what you originally had in mind out of us when you first breathed life into us. Thank you for the absolute joy of knowing the kind of love you've bestowed on us that we would be called the very children of God. That the one we call Father is the Father in heaven. That the one we will know and be known by for eternity is the one who breathed life into everything that exists. God, come and saturate us with your love today. Come and saturate us fresh. Pour out your Father's love into each of us. We just first want to say to you, happy Father's Day, God. Happy Father's Day. And my um, little girls, they don't, you know, they don't have much money, so they like to make gifts. And for Mother's Day, Father's Day, they make little, these cute little handcrafted gifts and I watch them because they always forget till one of the other parents reminds them, hey, Mother's Day's coming, Father's Day's coming soon. And then they scramble and they find whatever scraps they can or they'll, you know, ask for some things and they go scoot off in a corner or they lock the door to their room, say, not allowed to come in, you can't come in until it's done. And I don't know what they're going to come up with yet. I haven't seen it yet. They were asleep when I came in today. <laughs> but I know that just seeing that they desire to do something to show love back to me because of the love that I showed to them was all I needed, really. How many know that whatever we have to offer God, we call it sacrifice, we call it our gift to God, whatever it is that we give to him, it's just as cute to him as our little seven-year-old, five-year-old making a card or making some cute little craft out of toilet paper roll and whatever they could find laying around the house. (laughs) That it's not, it's the thought that counts. And as as the Father right now receives our love gift on Father's Day, I just so felt his pleasure being poured out into this gathering right here today. I just want to encourage you to keep telling him happy Father's Day and enjoy the Father this morning. Amen? Amen. All right. We can have a seat. Uh, we are um, we're going to dedicate what, what a better way to celebrate. Happy Father's Day to all the dads here, by the way, too. You get in on the action, too, not just God. Um, what a better way to celebrate Father's Day than to dedicate some babies and young children to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to call, uh, uh, kids, I'm going to call you up, and you can bring your parents and whatever other family are here with you up to the front, okay? So Benaya Leo Houtman, come on down. We have some gifts for you over here. Amber will be giving to you as you come up. Uh, Samuel Latshaw, bring your your crew down, the whole family, come on down and gather around. You're going to need to spread out because we've got a lot today. Um, Emma Grace Miller, come on down. You can bring your parents too, Emma. Anderson Wayne Moore, come on down. Lacey Mae Hoffman, have you seen this girl on Facebook? Man, it's the cutest videos on Facebook. Unbelievable. All right, and then the Peter Shimes are dedicating, all three of the Peter Scheim kids are coming, Ethan, James, Joanne, Lydia, and Keith Emmanuel, come on down with your parents. Let's spread out across the front. Awesome. I'll tell you what, we got the cutest kids in this church. If any, that's my unbiased opinion. Cutest church. Hey, Millers, come on up to the front over there. You kind of got lost in the back. Come on, you got a front row seat for this. We could scoot more to the middle. Maybe um, you guys could scoot over a little bit and let them in. All right. I'm going to briefly exhort you because obviously the babies and the young children are not the ones making covenant today. It's the parents, grandparents. And by the way, it's the spiritual family. The reason why we're doing this in public is because all of us, you know, in the Catholic Church, I think in the Episcopal Church where I grew up, they have godparents. And the idea is that you're going to make sure you, that you keep the parents in line to raise their children in Christ. That's the idea of godparents, I guess. Well, this whole church are godparents, right? 
We're a family. We're not just a gathering that gets together on Sundays to worship together. We're a family. So I'm going to urge you what I'm about to exhort these parents with. Take it for yourselves also, for all of us, that we will raise a generation in our church that loves the Lord. So I want to exhort you with something. It's a story that captured my heart last week as I was reading through Kings. Um, This is about King David's great-grandson, Abijam, who uh, became king two generations after Solomon. And it says that he walked, Abijam that is, walked in all the sins of his father, which he'd committed before him. And his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, like the heart of his father, David. That's kind of a bummer of a verse to read at a baby dedication, your great-grandchildren. There's David, man after God's own heart, and his great-grandsons not walking with the Lord. But here's good news. For David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem to raise up his son after him and establish Jerusalem, because David did what was right in the sight of the Lord and didn't turn away from anything he commanded him all the days of his life. And then it goes, it says, well, except for that one thing that happened with Uriah. And there was war and all of this. And, um, and that. so here, here's the good news. And here's my exhortation to you. We, we are believing that generations down the road will follow in our footsteps in Christ. That we as parents are demonstrating, not just teaching our kids, not bringing them to church so they could teach them in the kids' church. You're making covenant, dedicating your children to the Lord because you are saying, I'm going to walk with Him. I'm going to pave a way for my children to follow after. I'm going to make it so easy for them to love Jesus by just watching me that they're going to have to work really hard to walk away from the Lord. So that even if my great-grandchildren walk away because of how I lived my life, God's going to look with favor on my family and say, I'll turn them back again. Even if they turn away down the road, I am going to turn them back again because you were faithful. So parents, the simplest piece of parental wisdom I can give you is just walk with the Lord with all your heart. Walk with the Lord with all your heart. You're going to make mistakes like all of us do. Your children are going to do things. It's all going to happen, just like it does for everybody else. I don't know about all of you. Starting out as a new parent, I was convinced that I was going to be the one that broke the mold, and my kids were going to be perfect. We were going to have that model. It was going to be like a television family. Why are you laughing? Because <laughs> you know my family. So, and, and you know how many, it just doesn't turn out like that. The, our, the kids do the things, and we do the things, and we all sin, and we all fall short, and we all do that stuff. But because David loved God, because David was a man after God's own heart, and you know David's story. He was no, <laughs> we wouldn't allow him to teach Sunday school with some of the things he did. Actually, a lot of the things he did. But he was a man after God's own heart, and God saw that, and God said, you know what? David, I love David so much. Even if you turn astray, I'm going to pull you all back again. Your family is going to be in Christ because of the life you live for his glory right now. So that's all I can urge you with. And saints, I want to urge you, surround these guys. I don't want to ask you to physically do that now. Come on, run down to the front as quick as you can. Surround whatever baby you want to get close to. Just try not to suffocate anybody. And let's pray a blessing over these children and especially over their parents as they embark on this great journey. Sorry, I should get out of the aisle. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of children, proof that your hand is on us, because the children are the heritage of the Lord, and we thank you for entrusting us, for seeing fit to trust us with your very heritage. So we covenant as a church right now to surround these parents and these children with your presence and with your loving kindness. We as a church make covenant right now to to engage with these families in a way that helps them to follow through on the covenant they're about to make. We pray for these parents right now as they devote their children to you, as they make covenant saying, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I pray that you'll give them faithfulness, that you'll give them a gift of faith and you'll give them the gift of perseverance for the seasons when life gets very difficult, for the seasons when they're dealing with 
family strongholds, when they're dealing with all kinds of things that, that hell would like to do to destroy these families. Thank you for giving them strength and courage to follow through on the covenant that they make today to raise these children in Christ. And we bless these precious little ones. And we thank you for them and pray that your presence will fill them from this moment onward for the remainder of their days that they will also fall in love with you, have their own abiding faith in Jesus Christ, love you the way their parents do, and serve you with all their hearts. We ask you for great grace for this, Father. It's a difficult day to raise children, a difficult culture to raise holy children in. But we thank you that greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. We love you, Jesus. We love these children. And we thank you for the privilege of devoting them to you this day. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and hug on each other and then grab a seat when you can. Kids, or you want, you want me to be kids? I'll be. Well, I do just want to pray a blessing over the fathers before I go, um, and I apologize for being in and out today. We're in between. James will take care of that. Thank you, though. <laughs> If the ushers would not wave bags at me, we would never take an offering in this church. If I'm in charge, it would never happen. So um, uh, we're in between vacations right now. I just came in because I love baby dedications, and I miss seeing your faces. So I'm going to just scan your faces now, and then I'm out the door, and we're on our way to camp again for this week. So pray for us because it's like thunderstorms in the forecast every day this week. That'll be epically fun, uh, camping with the family. But fathers, I wanted to exhort you with something, and we're going to pray for you. And this is a a scripture in Isaiah 49, and um, I I don't have a Father's Day message for you, but I I do have an exhortation for you dads, and uh, all the spiritual dads are in the house too. This is Isaiah 49, starting in 22. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hands to the nations and set my standard to the peoples. They will bring your sons in their bosom, and your daughters will be carried on their shoulders. Kings will be your guardians and their princesses, your nurses. They will bow down to you with their faces to the earth, lick the dust of your feet, and you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hopefully wait for me will never be put to shame. Can the prey be taken from a mighty man or the captives of a tyrant be rescued? Surely, thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty man will be taken away and the prey of the tyrant will be rescued. For I will contend with the one who contends with you and I will save your sons. Um, we're in a, of course, we're living in a day where the whole idea of gender is very confused in the culture around us right now. And I want to just share a word to all the dads in particular about how we've been wired by God and part of what God made us to be. And I want to exhort you with something as fathers, and again, as spiritual fathers too, that there is an all-out, of course, has always been since the dawn of time, an all-out desire on the enemy's part to rob our children from us, to draw them into other philosophies, other ways of life, into sin itself, and so on. And uh, the reason why men get all jacked up, if I, I'm not good at it, but if I would be like a, a general up in front of a crowd of men who are ready to go into battle right now and tell you about how incredibly prepared you are, how you are the most courageous, brave, best trained group of fighting men the world has ever seen, and you are going to be victorious on this day. People will be talking about what happens on this battlefield for the next 20 generations of all time in history will record the brave stand we took on this hill today. It sends shivers up most men's spine when somebody knows how to do that really well, because there's something in us of the heart of the Father in heaven, and it's the heart of a warrior. It's the heart that says, oh, you ain't taking my kids. If You, you know, the, we always talk about the mama bear thing, and that's not to minimize that, because you don't mess with a mama bear either. 
But you don't mess with a dad when it comes to his kids either. There's something of the father. It's from the father is what I'm trying to say. That that's not this macho, you know, mansplaining kind of whatever gobbledygook they talk about these days. That there's something that rises up in protection for those who can't protect themselves. And I want to urge you, fathers, not to give up on protecting your children, on protecting the children of this house, on being men of honor who are willing to fight until the last breath to preserve our families in Christ, to preserve all of those that are within our care in Christ, that get, take that warrior spirit in you, I'm saying, and contend, because the Father himself contends with us, and he'll make sure, he'll see to it, that our generations down the road remain in Christ. So I'm urging you to keep fighting the good fight of faith. Hold on to it. Blaze, blaze a trail for our children to follow after, where even though they see our failures and faults, even though they see all the weaknesses and, and areas that are not like Christ, what they'll be able to say is, yeah, though a righteous man, I watched a righteous man fall a thousand times, but the Lord picked him back up again and upheld him with his righteous hand. That's what, that's what it looks like to blaze a trail and to fight for our kids. So kids and everybody, can we gather around all the dads? I want to pray a blessing over us. So kids, if you brought your dad to church today, Gather around your father, and if, if there's some men around that don't have kids with them, I'm not just talking biological fathers. I'm talking about all the men. You are spiritual fathers to the children of this generation. So you, I know you guys are only in your 20s, but you can get the men over here too. These, these men are about, oh, by the way, welcome Camp Hebron. They just finished orientation this week. Woo! <laughs> Almost forgot to do that. I'm not in mode. So uh, they get the kids arrive today at camp, and there, there'll be uh, some of them. I don't know how many of them will make it to churches on sun, churches to church on Sunday after they start getting tired over the summer. But welcome and bless you guys. All right, let's pray for the dads. Father, we thank you so much for the absolute privilege of fatherhood and what it means to be an earthly representation of the Father who is in heaven. Thank you for the courage that you've given every one of these men to fulfill their destiny and their purpose in raising up a generation in Christ, contending with the enemy and the forces of darkness that would seek to draw people away from the Father in heaven. God, I pray that you'll anoint us and give us that mantle of warriors to be able to stand and having done all to stand, to continue to stand. We bless these dads, pray that they'll receive great grace and great comfort today and great joy in their own children in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I love you guys. See you next week. Love you too, Pastor Steve. I'll call you. I gotta check it Okay. Isn't that cool that he came in between vacation just to be here with us for a few minutes today? Isn't that awesome? Aren't you thankful for Pastor Steve? Yeah. All right, worship team, if you guys can get back up, come back up. We're going to get ready to worship a little bit more. And the kids are going to go back to kids' church. So kids, come on up. Megan, come on up. And you can tell us what's going to happen this morning in kids' church. Well, with it being Father's Day, the kids are going to be learning about how to spend time with their Heavenly Father. And they're also learning about Jesus being the bread of life. And they're going to meet this awesome superhero that they have inside each and every one of them. So I'll let them tell you about that when they get home. But yeah, there will be a superhero in class today and bread. So, I mean, two awesome things in class today. All right, if you guys will extend your hands forward, we're going to pray over the kids. Lord, thank you so much for the awesome time that we're going to have today. I thank you for each and every one of these wonderful kids that are going to join us learning about you as their father. And I also thank you, Lord, for the fathers that are sending their kids back to us, that they're entrusting your kids to us, God. So thank you so much for the amazing time we're going to have today and just really touch everyone's heart here today. In your name, amen. Thanks, Megan. Bye, kids. We'll see you later. We're going to continue worshiping, so feel free to stand up and uh, as we sing some more about God's goodness. Roll. 
roaring this thunder with a new future to tell for the dry season is over there is a cloud beginning to swell to the skies heavy with blessing lift your eyes offer your heart Jesus Christ open the heavens now we receive the spirit of God we receive your rain we receive your seed buried in sorrow you will call forth in its time you are Lord Lord of the harvest calling our hope and now to rise we receive your rain receive your rain we receive your rain we receive your rain we receive your rain like a flood like a flood, like a flood, we receive your love when you come. Like a flood, like a flood, we receive your love when you come. Like a flood, like a flood, we receive your Love when you come like a flood, like a flood, we receive your love. Receive your love, God, all of who you are, God. great anticipation we await the promise to come everything that you have spoken will come to pass let it be done it's done God you do it God We receive your rain. We receive your rain. We receive your rain. Down 
on my life I'm giving up control I'm never looking back And I surrender all I'm living for your glory on the earth There's passion in my heart is stirring in my soul to see the nations bound for all the world to know I'm living for your glory on the earth if you agree with that can you sing this out with me for the sake of the world for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me light a flame in my soul for every eye to see for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me this passion in my heart this passion in my heart stirring my soul to see the nations bow for all the world to know for your glory on the earth for the sake for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me and light a flame in my soul for every eye I sing, and for the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. For every need to bow down, for every need to bow down, for every heart to believe, for every voice to cry out, burn like a fire in me. For every time to confess, you alone are the King, you are the hope of the earth, burn like a fire in me. the sake of the world for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me light a flame in my soul for every eye to see for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. Light a flame in my soul for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. Sing it one more time for the sake. For the sake of the world, Burn like a fire in me, light a flame in my soul for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. This morning, I am so grateful that that is the heart cry of our church, that we want to see Jesus lifted up in our midst, that in everything we do and that everywhere we go, people see Jesus in us. And this we have a group of nine people that are going out with the express purpose of that, of making Jesus known in our own community. And so for those students and adults that are, that are going, would you join me? Students and three adults that are going to be sent out right after church today. They're going to be uh, serving our own community this week. They're going to be Likens Valley. Uh, and by the way, we have three very capable adults that are leading this trip. This is a mission trip, and I am not leading this trip. This is another level of delegation for me, by the way. But 
Amber and Tracy and Corey are very well equipped and ready to lead this trip. And I'm so excited to see the fruit that's going to come from them as they go and serve people, as they get stretched outside of their comfort zone, as they have extended times uh, alone with the Lord. And I just wanted to take a couple minutes to pray for them. Would some of you join me up front as we pray for them? If, if some of your family's up here, some friends, come on up. Let's, let's bless them as they get ready to go and be a light to our community. Lord, thank you for equipping these students and these adults for this week of ministry that you've prepared for them. Lord, we know that you've already gone ahead of them, and you've prepared assignments, you've prepared people, you've prepared projects where they can go in and manifest the goodness of God. Lord, I pray that their hearts and their minds would be so receptive to what you want to do. Lord, bless them this week as they pour in and as you pour out through them. Amen. I'd encourage you, church, to be praying for them this week. Some nights are going to be a little bit easier. Some nights are going to be tough. They're going to be working from sunup to sundown, ministering to people. So please uh, keep them in your prayers and thoughts. By the way, Wednesdays in the words can, Wednesday in the Word continues. Uh, this week we have Kelly Cutting with us. She is going to be teaching on uh, the Romans 12 list of gifts. And these are our, our motivational gifts. They are the way that we see life. They're the reason why we do certain things. And if you've never gone through it, I encourage you to go through it. If you've gone through it before, I would encourage you to go through it again because Kelly is an, really an expert on this. She taught um, Pastor Dave and the other senior pastors down at Christ Community on this topic. So I think if she can teach them, I've got a lot I can learn from her. So I want to encourage you to come out for that. That's Wednesday at 6.30. And then the week after, Pastor Steve will be back and he'll be teaching on, I forget if it's Revelation, Revelation Part 4. It's Revelation. I'm glad he's teaching it, not me, because that is a confusing book. Amen? All right. Um, this morning, I've got something I'm going to share with us, and it, it kind of stemmed out of something that happened a couple weeks ago. I was going through my, my, my regular Bible study. Uh, I've got a version reading app. How many of you do Bible studies from, reading, uh, from version? I'm just curious. Yeah, Awesome. For those of you that don't, check it out. It's this free app, and it's got all these Bibles and all these translations you can download, and there are like thousands of Bible reading plans. It's really cool. And so I was going through mine, and then all of a sudden this passage jumped out to me because it was so weird. It was so odd. 
you know, if you've been around church and if you've ever read the scriptures, if you know who God is, then you understand that God is love and that God's nature is to heal and to restore and that God is so redemptive in everything. And this passage just seems so opposite of everything that I know about Jesus. And so it really struck me as odd. And so I moved on. No, I'm just kidding. I decided to dig into it. And I got to tell you that whenever those things happen, whenever you see things that cause questions in your life, dig into those questions in the scripture and ask God to reveal to you what's going on. See, we live 2,000 years or more uh, separated. Our cultures are very different than the Bible. And so we don't understand things that would have made sense to the original hearers. And so we have to dig a little bit to understand what's going on. If you've got a Bible, you can join me in Matthew 21. We're going to start there. And Logan, if you can make that bigger for me, that'd be awesome. Now, by the way, we have to understand the context before we jump into the scripture. Um, How many of you know that you can take one scripture and isolate it and make it say whatever you want? Yeah, this is not a political statement, by the way. I'm just saying that we can take a scripture and make it say whatever we want. And so we need to understand the greater picture about what's going on. And so Matthew 21, it starts off with this scene that's going on. Uh, I want to show it to you. In your Bible, it may have a heading similar to mine. Let's see if the computer catches up to us. But it says, Matthew chapter 21, Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. And what's going on in the beginning of this chapter is that Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and this is Palm Sunday that we know. This is the beginning of what we call uh, the Passion Week. This is Jesus' last week of life and ministry before he's crucified. And he goes into Jerusalem, which, by the way, was about three times its normal population because Passover was coming, and all these friends and relatives and outsiders would be coming into Jerusalem to get ready to celebrate the Passover. And with that swelling of the city... Jesus is coming in on the foal of a donkey. Right, Todd? I remember you taught about that, and that struck me. It's not a donkey. It's the foal of a donkey, whatever that is. A baby donkey, I guess. Yes. And so Jesus comes in, and then the people are so excited that they start tearing down palm branches, and they're putting their coats on the road. And this is a way of honoring the person that's coming in. Jesus is coming in through the gates of the city that goes right into the temple. And they're crying out something. Who knows what what do they cry out as he comes? What's the word? Hosanna. Hosanna. And Hosanna literally means save now, save us. And it's this cry of a people that are under oppression. And they're crying out, you who's coming into the city, save us from this injustice we're under. Save us from this oppression. What they mainly felt was that they were under Roman rule and they weren't free to worship the way that they really wanted to. And so they wanted a Messiah to come and deliver them politically uh, with force from Rome. And so there's this cry and this celebration, this jubilee, looking at Jesus coming in. That's the beginning, and that's the context of this. And then we're going to start in verse 18 of Matthew 21. It says, Jesus curses a fig tree. Now, I don't know about you, but let this alone, Jesus curses, is confusing, right? How many of you have ever heard Jesus cursing before? We haven't. So Jesus curses something is already It makes me wonder, what is going on here? And then Jesus curses a fig tree. Jesus curses creation. I'm already lost. I thought Jesus created creation. I thought Jesus created things. Jesus blesses things. And yet, this is called Jesus cursing a fig tree. So let's dive in and see what happens. Early in the morning, so now this is Monday morning. Jesus, by the way, has spent the night in Bethany, uh, which is a town nearby. So he's spending the week in Jerusalem, but he and the disciples are going back home to Bethany probably at a friend's house to sleep every night. So early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city of Jerusalem, he was hungry. And he sees a fig tree by the road, and he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. And he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. And immediately the tree withered. And when the disciples saw this, they were amazed. Did the fig tree How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. And Jesus says, you know what, I'm just going to read from here. Logan, can you keep up with me, bud? Thanks. Awesome. 
Jesus says, truly, I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Now, this is pretty confusing, but you know, I read it in a different gospel and it gets even more confusing. By the way, there's four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they tell the story of Jesus and they're different because they tell it from different perspectives. Think of like a TV show or a movie. There's different camera angles going on. And each of these Gospels is like a different angle at Jesus' life and ministry. So they're different. They tell things a little bit differently. And this version is going to show something that we didn't see in Matthew. Now, by the way, whenever you see discrepancies, some people find that as a reason to disbelieve the Bible. If the Bible can't get these facts together, then how do we know that it's even true? If it can't get their facts straight, then how do we know that the main message that what it says that Jesus is God makes any sense? That's kind of a fair question, isn't it? Well, if you're curious about this, you can Google a guy by the name of J. Warner Wallace. J. Warner Wallace. He was an atheist all of his life, and his wife kept dragging him to church. He had to read the Gospels himself. And he saw discrepancies, and continuing his disbelief, changed his disbelief into belief. See, J. Warner Wallace is a core investigator. He looks into that have gone. And what he knows professionally is that when the stories line up, that somebody made something up. See, no two eyewitnesses will ever see something the same. If I ask Corey to come up and stand here for a second and sit back down, some people might remember that he's not, some people will remember that he's wearing a red shirt. Some may think it's an Adidas shirt. Some may think that it's Nike. None of us will remember all the facts the same. And so J. Warner Wallace recognized that if everything is the exact same, then somebody collaborated and put this story together and it didn't really happen. And so when he sees these little discrepancies, it made him actually have faith that what actually happened was true. That's a little aside for you. So let's let's dive into what Mark says. Uh, Mark chapter 11, starting in verse 12. Jesus curses a fig tree, and he clears the temple courts. So already something's getting added in. Jesus clears, or Jesus curses a fig tree, and now something's going to happen in the temple. This is going to be interesting. So this is what it says. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. So far, it's the same, right? Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Mark tells us that it wasn't the season for figs. Now, hold up. Jesus is looking for fruit, and it's not even the season for harvest? That's pretty interesting, isn't it? That's what made me cause and wonder about it, and we're going to dig into it. I'm not going to tell you yet. We're going to come back to that question. And so he says to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again, and his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? Doesn't this seem like a Snickers commercial, by the way? Like, you're not you when you're hungry? It almost feels like it could play out. Jesus went to the tree because he was hungry and he didn't get anything and so he's mad and he's got low blood sugar and so he curses the tree. And he didn't get a snack so he goes into the temple and starts flipping tables over. This feels like it would be a Snickers commercial to me, right? Yes. But there's something more going on and that's what we're going to talk about. So the chief priests and the teachers of the law, they heard this and they began looking for a way to kill him. After what he does in the temple, they began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, this is the next day, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots, and Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Now, I I took note that Peter, this kind of amazed Peter. Peter, who had seen Jesus do many miracles. He'd seen blind eyes opened. He'd seen Lazarus rise from the dead. He had walked on water himself. Peter is amazed. And you know what that tells me is that no matter how long we've been walking with Jesus, no matter how many amazing things we've seen him do, 
you and I should be constantly amazed at who Jesus is and what he does. If Peter was amazed, I want to continue to be amazed by what Jesus does in our lives. Amen? And Jesus teaches now. He goes into teaching mode. He says, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Man, I have so many questions about this passage. Do you? Yeah, good. Thanks, Paul. Um, Before we get there, we got to understand a couple things. We need to understand the significance of a fig tree. See, fig trees are really special to Israel. I think I have a picture of a fig tree. Uh, Fig trees is one of the things that's talked about in the promised land. There's one. That's a sycamore fig tree, by the way. Uh, Yeah, sycamore is in the Bible. I'll tell you about it in a second. I keep giving you these previews about what I'm about to say. But fig trees are really significant. The 12 spies that went into the promised land that Moses sent out, they came back with grapes and figs. I forgot about the figs. I always remember the clusters of grapes that were so big, but they came back with figs too. And then the fig is seen as a promise of what the good life will be like. It's the, the fig is seen as uh, a promise and prosperity and peace. Just this morning, I was reading from 1 Kings. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, lived in safety, everyone under their own vine and under their own fig tree. And so the fig tree is this symbol, this picture of a life that you don't have to work and toil outside to grow something, but it just grows naturally. It doesn't say the promised land is full of fields that you have to cultivate and work hard. It says the promised land is full of figs and of grapes, things that you sit under and simply enjoy. And so that's what the fig tree represents, is a time of peace, a time of prosperity. And on the flip side, we see in the Old Testament prophets, they talk about that when the wrath of God comes, that the fig tree is destroyed. That peace and that prosperity is gone because the people have disobeyed God. And a fig tree, by the way, was kind of public property. Anybody could go along and pluck figs from the tree whenever it was ripe. So what Jesus wanted to do to pick fruit was legal. It wasn't trespassing. Uh, Yeah, so figs, you could pick them. Now let's talk about the leaves a little bit. Leaves are really interesting. Jesus went, and what did he find on the tree? Leaves. He found leaves. This is a picture of fig leaves. And what a fig leaf is, is it's something on the outside that's a reflection of what's on the inside. It's a cover on the outside for what's happening internally. If you see a tree in leaf, that means that the tree is growing and it's alive. If you see a tree with no leaves on, you know that it's dead and that nothing's going on. And so fig leaves are a sign that life is happening. And you and I can spend time, we, we, we have fig leaves too. Adam and Eve had fig leaves. When they sinned and separated themselves from God, the thing that they used to cover their nakedness and their shame was fig leaves. It was a cover for what was going on on the inside. They were ashamed, and instead of bringing their shame to God and letting him work in that, they covered themselves. And you and I, we can have fig leaves too. These are the things that we put out on the outside of of our life to show that we're doing well, right? It's chasing after the nice house, or the nice car, or maybe the title, the promotion, to show people that we are successful in life. I think social media can be a lot of fig leaves, right? We can can post that we are doing really well when on the inside we're dry and dead. We can post that we're the perfect parent, that we're the perfect spouse, but on the inside, it's not really there. And we can spend a lot of time focusing on leaves and not on fruit. And leaves on a tree, they provide shade. That was one of the nice things about a fig tree. You saw how big it was. People would sit under it, and they would get out of the heat of the day, and they would relax. But leaves don't provide any sustenance. They don't give us any nutrition to move forward in life. They give us a chance to relax, but not a chance to actually move forward in life. And that is where fruit comes in. I want to show you this picture. Uh, Fig fruit is super interesting, by the way. 
It is the only tree that I know of, and I am not a botanist or a gardener or anything like that. But it's, a fig fruit is actually a flower. You can kind of see it. It's like the beginning of a flower, but it turns from the outside in. Right? So it's, a, it's flowering, it's growing, it's got petals, but instead of opening up, it turns inward and produces a fruit. And just like normal flowers, the fig fruit needs pollination. And so figs, for them to actually grow, it takes a fig wasp to come with pollen and to land inside it and to bring pollen, and then that's what causes the fig to grow. And the wasp, when it flies in, it loses its wings, and it stays in there. Now, the crunchy part that you eat in the fig is not a wasp. <laughs> the wasp actually gets digested by enzymes in the fig, and it stays in there. So the crunchy part isn't the wasp, but you are eating digested, dissolved wasp whenever you eat a fig. Isn't that yummy? So there's this, there's this relationship that happens. The fig needs the wasp to grow and to produce. But the, the wasp also needs the figs. I told you as a flower, it brings pollen in, but then it lays its baby fig wasp eggs inside. And it grow, they grow inside there. And then they fly out. So you don't eat those either. They fly out. But it is this symbiotic relationship where the fig needs the, the fig wasp to grow and the fig wasps needs, need the fig to produce their babies. It's this really weird symbiotic relationship. And when I read this, this is one of, uh, one of the reasons why a fig tree won't have any fruit is because the wasp uh, dropped off its babies but didn't bring any pollen. And the fig tree will say, no, uh I'm not going to do that for you. I'm not going to be your host unless you help me out. And so it'll actually drop the fruit and it'll kill the baby wasps. Sounds so sad, doesn't it? And so when I read this, I thought, this must be the reason why Jesus came to the fig tree and there was nothing there. Because we're going to find out that the fig tree, this whole instance of Jesus cursing the fig tree, was about Jerusalem, and Jerusalem rejected, rejecting Jesus. And I thought, that's it. Biology makes sense. The reason why there was no fruit was because the wasps around that tree didn't pollinate those flowers. And it, I would have preached it like, if we don't receive what Jesus is doing, then we can be like a tree without fruit. And that would have made a lot of sense, wouldn't it? That was going to be a fun sermon. But I discovered a little bit more. There was a pastor in town. His name was Steve Heinbaugh. He used to pastor at Trinity UCC. I remembered him from years ago. He was a great man. I don't know if any of you ever had a chance to meet him. But I remember he brought figs to a ministerial meeting. And I remember him telling Pastor Steve and I about these figs. And something he said blew my mind. But I couldn't remember what it was. So I reached out to him on Facebook, and he, he, we talked about it. He said, I've got a couple trees, and I've learned some things, and this parable makes sense to me now that I have fig trees. And he told me that fig trees have two seasons of harvest. There's the one season with the fruit that you and I can eat. Here's some dried figs, by the way. I've been eating these all week trying to understand what Jesus was talking about. Does anybody want one, by the way? Todd, you want one? I'll hand these out snack time. This is gonna, here. Here, Corey, my Vanna White, can you hand those out to people? <laughs> sure. Isn't he a good Vanna White, by the way, church? All right, Corey's going to pass those around, show and tell. <laughs> Remember, the wasps are digested. They're not actually in there anymore. So fig fruit comes in like August and September. And we know that... Jesus was coming along the week of Passover, so we're talking about April. So when it says that it's not the season for fruit, it's because we're months away from that season of harvest, right? The, the, the harvest season is in August. Jesus is in April. He's coming and looking for something when there's not even supposed to be figs there yet. Man, this just gets more confusing. Jesus is cursing a fig tree because there's no fruit that's not even supposed to be there in harvest time. But I found out that there's another season for figs. See, in the beginning of the spring, after the leaves grow, there will be something else growing. These little nubs, these little buds that grow on a fig tree. Now, these will not be fig fruit. Nobody will eat these. They're not delicious. They're really gross. They're very bitter. And this does not become fruit. But it is a sign that fruit is coming. These buds are a sign that fruit is coming. And this is what Jesus would have seen on the street this time. He would have seen that there's something growing, even when it isn't time for harvest yet. 
And that's my message title, by the way, this morning. Will you turn to your neighbor and say, it isn't time yet? It isn't time yet. See, Jesus was going, he, he was saying, the harvest time isn't yet, but I should see something growing on this tree. It isn't the time for harvest. It isn't the time for this season to, to produce fruit, but I should see something happening on this tree. And this is what I felt like he was speaking to me about this, is that it may not be the season for harvest in your life. There may be things that you are waiting on in life, but there should be something growing. There should be something producing in your life that is going to be the beginning of fruit. And I felt honestly like this is an affirmation to our church. As I, as I spend time with you and I know your lives, I see something growing even while you're waiting for the answer to the things that you're praying for. I see fruit budding. I see nubs of faith in your life as you wait for that season of harvest to come. Amen? So what does this look like in our lives? I bet that for each and every one of us, there's a harvest season that you're waiting for. There's something that you were praying for. If you're a parent and you know that we've been like three weeks into summer break, you may be waiting for summer break to be over so your kids can get out of the house and back to school. If you're a young person, maybe you're waiting for school to be done so that you can move on with your life, so that you can get a job, so that you can get out of mom and dad's house and out of the rules. And maybe for you, that's the season that you're waiting for. If you're single, maybe you are waiting for that season of marriage to open up so that you can finally be with Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright. If you're married, maybe you are waiting for kids to come. If you have kids, maybe you're waiting for those kids to grow up and get out of the house. If you're a grandparent, maybe you're waiting for those grandkids to serve the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. All of us have something that we are looking forward to and we are praying, and we know it isn't time yet, but my prayer is that there's fruit growing in our lives. See, Jesus went to the tree and rejected it, not because he couldn't eat the fruit, but because it promised something growing, and it was found empty. The leaves were a promise of fruit, of nubs, of some sort of life, and it was found empty. When he looks at our lives, as he sees us in the waiting for the things that we are crying out for, will he see fruit? Will he see something there? Now, I told you that this was a living parable about Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was where he was going every day, and it was the capital of Israel, and these were the very people that should have received Jesus the most. They had all the knowledge and understanding. They had the scriptures and the hundreds of prophecies that pointed to Jesus being the Messiah. And instead of receiving him, they rejected him. Just later that week, they would crucify him. And so this parable is specifically about Jerusalem. These people that had a lot of promise of peace and prosperity and yet didn't have fruit. And in fact, in the next few decades, Jerusalem would be just about leveled by the Romans. And Jesus prophesied this. And it's because that they didn't show fruit of the kingdom that was coming. Now, of course, some people did. Those are the early Christians, and we know that they are the ones that took the gospel all across the known world. And this movement that started with just a few people has grown and has become the biggest life-changing force in the world. But the main people of Jerusalem, they missed it. And if we go back to the, the scene in the temple, Jesus, remember the Snickers commercial where he's flipping tables over and chasing the money changers out? There's something very specific that was going on. Jesus is in the outer courts, and in the outer courts, he hears all these animals that weren't even supposed to be in there, animals that were being sold. There's goats that are being sold. There's birds that are being sold. They weren't supposed to be in that spot to be sold. And then there's money changing that's going on. It's the Passover week, and so there's all these guests from out of town, and they, are, they want to worship, and so they want to buy an animal to sacrifice, but they have money from Egypt, and the temple doesn't take Egyptian money, so they have to trade their money for temple money. And when that happens, the people exchanging the money, they take some off the top, and they're making money off of the guests that are coming. Here's the thing about the, the outer courts, is that that was the one spot where Gentiles could be. The one spot in the temple were people who were ethnically far from God. These people that were once rejected but on their own had started a faith in God. These people that were not Jewish. And so they weren't allowed into the rest of the temple. But they were passionate about worshiping God. This was the only spot that they were allowed in. And in that only spot for them, it was filled with all this noise of animals 
and all this injustice and all this oppression. These people that were far from God, trying to get close to him, were treated with contempt. And there was all these things pushing against them to receive Jesus. And that's why Jesus goes in and starts flipping tables over, because he wants that place to be a place where people are wide open to connect with God. And instead of that wide openness, people are taking advantage of them. And so this is, again, a picture of Jerusalem, of this old system being rejected. See, Jesus, when he died on the cross, he died for you and I so that our sins, the things that we've done that break his heart, could be forgiven. Jesus so, was so passionate about opening up the doors for every single one of us to come to him that he, changed, he chased the people out of the temple, he flipped tables over, and he died on the cross for you and I so that we could know him. That's what was going on in this picture. Now, by the way, I told you that I believe that this is an affirmation to our church, that I see fruit growing in your lives in the waiting. But I don't know what's going on in your heart right now. I can't know what's going on in your heart. Only you do. And if you're feeling a sense of judgment, a sense of, I don't have anything growing, then I have to look to the book of Luke that doesn't have these two things, but it has the parable of the barren fig tree. See, Jesus tells this story in Luke chapter 13, verses 6, 7, 8, and 9. And he tells a story about a man who had a tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but he didn't find any. And so he says to the man who took care of the vineyard, a gardener, so to say, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? So this is the owner saying, I don't see any fruit. I'm done. Let's get it out and put something that will produce fruit in. And the gardener says, sir, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. And the owner says, if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. See, here's the thing is that Jesus is so patient with us. Jesus is so patient looking for fruit in our lives. There will come a day when all of us will stand before almighty, eternal God and have to give an account for our life. But until then, he is so patient looking for, working in our lives to see fruit in us. So if you already feel judged from this, know that Jesus is poised and ready to do a work in your life to bring fruit in your life. Amen? Let's take a look at this. Our response to the waiting. Our response to the waiting. By the way, I hate waiting. Todd told us the story this morning about getting stuck in traffic behind this car that was going 15 miles an hour under. That drives me nuts. Last week, I was behind a tractor going uphill on a backcountry road, and I thought, what is going on? This is PA patience, I guess. Does anyone like waiting in this room? No, we hate waiting for things. And so what do we do in the waiting? Well, fruit only grows when it's connected. It's not like a steak that when you take it off the grill, it continues cooking for a little bit more. So if you want it done medium, you have to take it off when it's a little bit more medium rare, right? It's Father's Day. I thought I'd put something about food in for you, about meat for you guys um, and ladies. But fruit only grows when it's connected. So as soon as you pluck the fruit off, it's done growing. And you and I are the same way, is that we grow when we're connected. We grow when we're connected to Jesus. And one of the greatest ways that we maintain our connection is what Jesus pointed to, and it's prayer. When we pray, our connection to God grows. It's established more and more. And Jesus talked about prayer, especially with this, and he he talked about mountains being moved. Now, I don't think he specifically meant if you want to see Mount Carmel move, then pray for it and it'll go, because we don't see any new islands popping up in in the Bible. He's speaking about obstacles in our life, these mountains, these things that we're looking for and we're praying for God to change. And he's encouraging us to continue to pray for them. And so prayer changes things. Prayer changes us. One, it gives us the ability to bear things that we don't want to bear. It gives us the ability to bear things that are difficult and trying. It gives us the ability to to maintain faith, even in seasons of waiting, when it isn't time yet. Prayer gives us the ability to continue on. And if you doubt that, look at Jesus' own life. At the very end, before he was crucified, he said, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass before me. But if not, let your will be done. Prayer enabled Jesus to bear something he didn't even want to bear. And so prayer gives us the ability to bear things that are hard. Prayer changes us because our understanding changes. 
And then also prayer gives us the ability to do ministry, and it gives us the ability to have power in our lives to see things changed. We can't move obstacles on our own. We only can as we're connected to God. And so he gives us the power and the opportunity, and he puts things in alignment for situations to change. And prayer changes situations. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes those obstacles that you've been looking at. Things don't happen on their own, but they happen because we're persistent in prayer. And so our response to the waiting is to pray. Our response to the waiting is to remain connected to God. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. We're going to get ready to um, close in a little bit. But this is my encouragement to you, is that whatever season you're in where it's not harvest time yet, where there's something where you would say, it isn't time yet, manifest fruit in your life. Show that there's something going on in your life where there's evidence of faith that's growing. It isn't time yet, but I'm pressing in. It isn't time yet, but I'm going to show fruit. It isn't time yet, but I'm not giving up. It isn't time yet, but I'm pressing in for more of God in my life. It isn't time yet, but I'm not done. I still have a fight left in me. It isn't time yet, but I am still going to believe God. I want to read one last thing before we close. The book of Hebrews, starting in, verse, in chapter 12, it tells the story of what's called uh, the people of faith. And it goes through all this list of people in the Old Testament that believed, even though they didn't see things yet. I'm sorry, Hebrews 11. It starts off by saying, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we don't see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So faith is believing even though you don't see it yet. Faith is believing even though it isn't time yet. I believe even though it isn't time yet. I'm pressing in even though it isn't time yet. That's what faith is. And the writer of Hebrews goes through this list of people. By faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. Do you know the story of Noah? He built a boat even though it had never rained. It's not even the time for rain yet. He has no concept of what it is, and yet he believes God even when it's not the season for rain. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Sarah. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised, and yet they didn't give up. By faith, Moses. By faith, the prostitute Rahab. And then he lists all these other people. And then in Hebrews 12, this is what he gets to, and he says, he or she, we don't know who wrote Hebrews, by the way. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all these people that have been examples of the faith to us, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. How do we do that? By fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. My friends, whatever it is that it isn't time yet for, continue to persist in prayer and in believing in God. Let me pray, and we're going to sing, and then you, we'll be dismissed in a few minutes. Jesus, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you looked at a tree when it wasn't even harvest season yet and called that there should be something growing. And you speak to us that while we're waiting, that there should be something growing within us. And I just hear such an affirmation to the people of Hillside today that, that Jesus sees growth. He sees you in your waiting. He sees you in your time alone. And he sees the things that nobody else sees, the faith that you possess, even in the quiet times, in the dark in the times where you're not sure what's going on, he sees your faith, church. And so, Lord, I ask for greater grace in the waiting, greater grace while we're waiting for you to come through, Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing something together before we close. You are my supply, my breath of life. Still more awesome than I know You are my reward Worth living for Still more awesome than I know And all of you Is more than enough for All of me And for every thirst And every need 
you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you is more than enough you're my sacrifice you're my sacrifice of greatest price still more awesome than I know you're my coming king you are everything still more awesome than I know and all of you is more than enough for all of me and for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you is more than enough more than all I want more than all I need yeah you are more than enough for me more than all I know more than all I can say yeah. You are more than enough And all of you is more than enough For all of me And for every thirst and every need And you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you is more than enough. You're more than enough. And all of you, and all of you is more than enough for all of me and for every thirst and every need. You satisfy me with your love, and all I have in you is more than enough. If you're looking for someone to pray with you or talk with after this, feel free to grab.